for such a great introduction. I can't wait to hear the speaker myself. First of all, I have a confession to make. Sometimes all these honors and introductions can backfire. Recently, New York Magazine had a contest to identify the 100 smartest people in New York. So I'm very proud to say I made the list. However, in all fairness, in all fairness, I have to admit that Madonna also made that same list. <laughs> and next year, they tell me that Lady Gaga is going to push me off the list entirely. Now today, I'm going to talk about the future, the future of AV, the future of how we will live in the future. Of course, it's very dangerous to make predictions. Let me quote from that great physicist from Denmark, Niels Bohr. Niels Bohr once said, quote, prediction is awfully hard to do, especially if it's about the future. Well, even comedians are worried about the future. Woody Allen once said, quote, eternity is an awful long time, especially toward the end. Well, why ask a physicist to talk about the future? Well, we like to invent things. We invented the transistor. We invented the laser. We wrote the World Wide Web. We helped to assemble the internet. And don't forget, we also invented television. We invented radio, radar, microwaves. In the hospital, we invented the MRI machine, the X-ray machine, the CAT scan. We also invented the space program and the GPS satellite. And we physicists love to make predictions. When we helped to assemble the internet, one physicist predicted that the internet would become a forum of high culture, high art, and high society. Well, today we know that 5% of the internet is pornography. But that's because teenage boys log on to the internet. Just wait until the grandmas and grandpas log on to the internet. Then 50% of the internet will be pornography. <laughs> now, before I begin to give you a guided tour of the next 10 to 20 years, let me tell you a cautionary story about another physicist. Over 200 years ago, of course, we had the great French Revolution. And one day there were three gentlemen about to have their heads chopped off at the guillotine. There was a priest, a lawyer, and a theoretical physicist, just like me, about to have our heads chopped off. Well, they put the priest's head on the chopping block, and they asked him, do you have any last words? And he said, yes, yes. He said, God, God from above shall set me free. Well, all eyes were on the blade. They raised the blade. The blade came down, swish, and it stopped right before it hit the neck of the priest. <gasps> the crowd gasped. They'd never seen this before. And the crowd cheered, let the priest go, because today God has spoken. And now let's see about the lawyer. Yes, the lawyer. They put the lawyer's head in the chopping block. And they asked him, do you have any last words? And he said, yes, maybe the spirit of justice and mercy. Yes, justice shall set me free. All eyes were on the blade. They raised the blade. The blade came down, swish, and it stopped right before it hit the neck of the lawyer. Well, this time, the crowd went crazy, dancing in the streets of Paris. People were saying, today, God has spoken. Justice has spoken. And now let's see about that physicist. Well, they put the physicist's head on the chopping block, and they asked him, do you have any last words? And he said, yeah, yeah, I got some last words. And he said, you know, I don't know too much about God, and I know even less about the law. But I do know one thing. If you look up, you'll see that the rope is stuck on the pulley. <laughs> and then he said, if you remove the rope, the blade should come down real good. <laughs> Big mistake. Big mistake. Well, the rope came down, the blade came down, and the poor physicist's head came down. And it just goes to show you that sometimes we physicists have to know when to keep our mouths shut. 
Nonetheless, let me open the mouths of over 300 of the scientists, the greatest scientists of the world that I've interviewed for BBC television, the Discovery Channel, the Science Channel, and my own national science radio show. In a previous book, I go not just 50, 100 years into the future, I actually go 500 years into the future. But we might have starships, teleportation, we might have warp drive on that scale. And in this book, I answer the question of all questions, the question that haunts all of us, and that is, is there intelligent life on the Earth? <laughs> Probably not. Just look at the newspapers, probably not. And in Future of the Mind, my latest bestseller, I talk about the revolution in telepathy, telekinesis, uploading memories. Did you know that we can actually connect the human mind to a computer? The internet will be replaced by brain net. On a scale of 10 to 20 years, we will send emotions, memories. We will send sensations on the internet. And of course, teenagers will go crazy. Can you imagine on Facebook, all the teenagers sending in memories of their first kiss, their first date, their first dance. Facebook will go crazy once we have brain net. But today, let us talk about the next five to 10 to 20 years. This is Moore's Law. It's perhaps the most important law of the last 50 years. And it simply says the computer power doubles every 18 months. On a log chart, it's a straight line. Now, if you take a look at 2020, 2030, you begin to realize something astounding, and that is the price of chips will eventually go down to about a penny, a penny a piece. This means that intelligence will be scattered in the environment like electricity today. Where is electricity? Electricity is everywhere and nowhere. It's under your feet, in the walls, in the ceiling. We don't even think about electricity. This means that the future of computation is to disappear, to be everywhere and nowhere, including the internet. The internet will also be everywhere and nowhere. And already, we can put the internet in your glasses. These glasses are actually more powerful than the Google glasses. These glasses actually recognize people's faces. So in the future, when you meet somebody, you'll see a biography next to their image. And if they speak to you in Chinese, it'll translate Chinese into English, giving you subtitles as they speak. How many times have you been at a con conference like this, and you bump into somebody, and you say, I know this person. It's Jim, John, Jake, I know this person. In the future, your glasses will say, it's Jim, stupid. You see him every year at the ISE conference here. And maybe tonight there's a cocktail party, and there's some very important clients and customers at that cocktail party, but you don't know who they are. In the future, you will know exactly who to suck up to at any cocktail party. There are three ways to do it. You can shoot the image right to the retina of your eye, you can use the glass as a screen, or you can have an eyepiece, like in Google Glasses, many ways to have information everywhere and nowhere. Already in the doctor's office, surgeons have the internet right there with the x-rays, with the CAT scans, with the biography of the patient right there in their contact lens. So this is the future of your home office, the future of your home entertainment center, information everywhere and nowhere. But there's a problem. Let's say you don't like glasses. Let's say you don't wear glasses. Then what are you going to do? Then in the future, you will blink. And you will be online. And who are the first people to buy internet contact lenses? College students taking final examinations. <laughs> they will blink and see all the answers to my exams right there in their contact lens. Who are the next people to buy internet contact lenses? Politicians. So they will never ever say anything goofy ever again. Actors, actresses will have instantaneous information. Tourists. If you're, for example, walking through the streets of Rome looking for remnants of the Roman Empire, there's not much left of the Roman Empire anymore. But as you walk through the Forum, you'll see the Roman Empire resurrected 
right there in your contact lens. And afterwards, you'll go to the bazaar and haggle with the merchants and see subtitles in any language you want. These simultaneous translations are so good now, they are comparable to UN translators uh, interpretations. That's how good they are at the present time. So we will have information everywhere and nowhere. And when you buy something, you'll simply blink. That's how you will buy things in the future. Now you've seen this before. There's a Hollywood movie which talks about augmented reality. Now, of course, virtual reality is for kids, for thrill seekers. You put on goggles and see a cartoon. That's called virtual reality. This is for adults. Augmented reality is for businessmen, is for soldiers, is for astronauts, is for tourists who want instantaneous information for free just by looking at it. Now, where have you seen this before? There's a Hollywood movie which first introduced augmented reality to the people of the world. This is the former governor of California. <laughs> this is Arnold Schwarzenegger in The Terminator. And when he sees a victim, there is a biography, a complete biography of the person you are talking to. So in other words, if you're talking to a client, you're talking to a potential customer, you're talking to an associate, you'll have instantaneous information anywhere, anytime. Now, of course, you may say to yourself, well, isn't this science fiction? I mean, blinking and having the information of the world's knowledge right there instantly by blinking? Well, it already exists. This is the United States military. This is called Land Warrior. It is this big. It's about, oh, half an inch tall. You put it on your helmet. I flew down to Fort Benning, Georgia, compliments of BBC television, and we filmed, we filmed this. I put on this goggle, you put it on your glasses or your helmet, you flick it, flick it over your eyepiece, and boom, you're online. You see the internet of the battlefield. Enemy forces, friendly forces, artillery, armor, aircraft, all of it right there in an eyepiece. Infinite information almost for free. Who else is interested in this? NASA the space program, because astronauts in outer space making repairs will simply blink and see the blueprint of the International Space Station as they make repairs in outer space. The Air Force is interested. If you were a jet pilot and the enemy airplane follows you underneath your airplane, you're dead meat. You can't see the enemy airplane. So the Air Force wants to put a TV camera underneath the jet so that when the enemy aircraft flies underneath the jet, it shoots the image into your contact lens. So as you pilot the jet, you will have X-ray vision, like Superman. You'll have, for workers, for example, will see a camera behind the wall shooting the image into their contact lens, so they will have infinite knowledge of what's happening on the other side of a wall. So it means that we're talking about the digitalization of life itself. For example, money. Today, of course, you can take your cell phone, point and click, point and click, and you bought something. Beyond that, you'll simply blink. So that's how we will shop in the future. We'll simply look at the object we want and blink. And here's your cell phone of the future. We can make paper intelligent. Every pixel is a transistor made out of plastic. We can scroll out a bigger screen or a smaller screen as you want right from your cell phone. So this is the cell phone of the future where screens can be any size you want. Afterwards, you simply fold it up and put it inside your cell phone. In fact, we can make yards of the stuff. In other words, this is the future of wallpaper. Your walls will become intelligent because chips only cost a penny a piece. And when they cost a penny a piece, we will also add artificial intelligence. Let's say it's four o'clock in the morning. All of a sudden you feel a pain in your chest. Is it a heart attack or is it the pizza you had last night? What are you gonna do? Call the police? Call an ambulance? No, you go to the wall and say, mirror, mirror on the wall. I want to see RoboDoc right now. 
boom, RoboDoc appears in your wallpaper. RoboDoc is artificially intelligent. Looks human, but is actually an animated figure. Accesses the entire database of the internet. Gives you sound medical advice almost for free. This is going to revolutionize medical care. IBM, other organizations are now working to put artificial intelligence everywhere. You simply talk to it and it gives you expert advice. These are called expert systems. Let's say you're in a car accident. You're in a car accident and you have to talk to a lawyer real fast. What do you do? You talk to Robo Lawyer. Robo Lawyer is right there, accesses all the legal literature, gives you sound legal advice, speaks in any language you want, and gives you great medical and great legal advice. And now we have the bad news. The good news is you'll have infinite information simply by blinking, by looking at your wristwatch, by talking to the wall. The bad news is in the future, we will have lawyers. Sorry about that. This only goes so far. You can't have robo lawyer argue before a judge, before a jury, taking depositions, making value judgments about human values, which change every few years. No, paralegals, paralegals, the people who do clerical work, the people who look up precedences, the people who make compilations of previous verdicts, those people will be phased out. Sorry about that. I'll tell you more about the job market and the enormous opportunities that are going to open up because of this revolution. So we're talking about the digitalization of capitalism itself. Now, what is capitalism? Capitalism is private ownership where prices are set by supply and demand. That's it, period. That's called capitalism. But you see, capitalism is imperfect. You don't know really how much things cost. In the future, we will have perfect capitalism. You will have infinite knowledge of who's cheating you, what the profit margin is, who has the best product simply by blinking. So media was the first industry to be digitalized. We all remember what happened to the music industry. The music industry said, ha, digitalization, People will always buy music the old-fashioned way. Wrong. Guess who controls the music industry today? Take a guess. Who controls music today? It's Apple computers through iTunes. What's the lesson here? The lesson here is that you're free to ignore everything I've been saying today. You are also free to go bankrupt. Because unless you digitalize, your competitor will digitalize and drive you out of business. Today is media being digitalized. First was music. Now it's newspapers, it's television, it's radio, it's magazines being digitalized. But now let's talk about the future. In the future, it'll be transportation, medicine, education, home entertainment, commercialization of AV. All of this will be digitalized in the coming decade. For example, this is your living room in the future. This is how you will relax after a hard day's work. When chips cost a penny, you'll be surrounded 360 degrees by intelligent screens. So if there's a football game, you'll be right there in the middle of the football field as all the action takes place around you. You'll be totally immersed in entertainment. Every industry will be digitalized. Now it's the toy industry. As you know, to toys have chips being placed in them to make them intelligent. This is creating a problem for the English language. We have a contradiction in terms called smart Barbie dolls. Another contradiction in terms is Microsoft works. <laughs> that is also a contradiction in terms. Television. We all spend hours in front of the TV, but 3D without glasses has always been the holy grail of television. Now we can do it. The secret of 3D without glasses is not the glasses at all. We spent 50 years barking up the wrong tree. 
The way to make 3D television is to create a screen, lenticular technology. Your TV screen of the future will have thousands of vertical lines. Each vertical line is a prism shown here. Cuts the image in half. One half goes to the left eye, one half goes to the right eye, and bingo, 3D without glasses. So in the future, images will be almost for free. Pictures will move. They'll be wraparound, flexible, three-dimensional, and holographic. So lenticular technology is now commercially available on certain video games. You can now buy video games where the, the characters jump out at you if you're in the sweet spot. In the future, it'll be your living room. We'll be immersed in three-dimensional images because of lenticular technology. So this is your cubicle of the future. It'll be flexible, wraparound, three-dimensional, gorgeous color. In the future, your cubicle will be so beautiful, you'll never get any work done in the future. This is the car of the future. Cars, of course, are driverless now because of radar, the GPS system. I drove this car. This car, BBC television flew me down to uh, North Carolina and they put me in this car. So there I was driving this car. And the cameraman from BBC in the back tells me, he says, let go of the steering wheel. And I say to him, you nuts? You crazy? I'm not gonna let go of the steering wheel. You crazy. And then he says to me, trust me, let go of the steering wheel. So I closed my eyes, I let go of the steering wheel, and the car drove itself. Now let's do a science experiment. After today's lecture, get in your car <laughs> and drive like this. Because that's how they drive in Silicon Valley. One of my associates is a CEO of a small company in Silicon Valley. This is how he drives to work. He reads the newspaper, he talks to the car, talks to the car, tells the car where to go, and it is legal legal in Silicon Valley for the car to just take off while he's reading the newspaper. And again, when you look outside, you'll know what you're looking at. You'll know who you're talking to. You'll have access to infinite amount of information simply by blinking. The seamless transfer of information, a library full of information right there coming at you anytime, any place. So when intelligence is everywhere and nowhere, Screens will be three-dimensional, they'll be holographic, you'll be able to interact at a meeting, for example. If certain people cannot show up at a meeting, no problem. Their holographic image will emerge and you'll have a meeting from people from around the world. This is also going to affect how we do shopping. Uh, let's say you're looking for the perfect wedding dress and you finally found it, the perfect wedding dress, right color, right size, but it's the wrong size, the wrong shape. What happens today? No sale. In the future, your 3D measurements are in the cloud. And every gown, everything will fit because this is called mass customization. Things will be customized for your specifications. Now Henry Ford, of course, was famous for giving us mass production. Henry Ford was famous for saying, quote, the American people can have any color car they want as long as it's black. Of course, digital manufacturing is now being in, coming into play. This is how we will celebrate Christmas. At Christmas time, instead of battling the hordes for that hot toy, you'll simply download, download the blueprint of the toy and print it out in your living room. Look at what you can do these days. Now liquid metals, metals can also be digitally, digitally sent over the internet. This will, I don't, I don't think this will replace mass production. However, it'll supplement, supplement the manufacturing process when you can manufacture machine parts instantly as they break down. And this is the future of the classroom. Uh, today, if you're sick or you play sick, uh, you don't go to school. You have your mother write a note, little Johnny is sick today and cannot go to school. Those days are gone. In the future, you'll have a robot sitting in your chair. That surrogate has your TV image in it. 
So you will see the teacher. The teacher will see you in your bed at home. Isn't the future wonderful? You'll never, ever be able to miss a single day of class in the future. This is called perfect capitalism. Because today, if you go to a store, you don't know who's cheating you. You don't. You don't know who has the best product. You don't know what the profit margin is. You don't know if they're gouging you or not. In the future, you're in contact lens or wristwatch, you'll scan all the items, and you will know exactly who's cheating you. Who has the best product? Who has the cheapest product? So supply and demand become perfect. And if you're the producer, this means that you will have data mining, big data, targeted marketing. You will know the demographics of who's buying your product. Who's the winner in this? The winner is the consumer, because things will be cheaper, more competitive, more efficient. But for the producer, it means more competition, more competition. So how do you approach the future? You have to be a surfer. A surfer rides the wave, knows when to get on the wave, when to ride the wave, and then waits for the next wave. If you go against the wave, you wipe out. So in the future, be a surfer. Look for the wave as it's welling up. Ride the wave for all it's worth. Now, of course, there are winners and losers in any revolution. Among the middle class, the big losers are middlemen, agents, brokers, low-level accountants. For example, stockbrokers no longer sell stock. Now, you may say to yourself, gee, the good doctor has finally lost his marbles. Stockbrokers no longer sell stock? That's right, you buy stock on the internet. In the future, you'll simply buy stock by blinking. So why do you need a stockbroker? Because you want something that robots cannot provide, and that is intellectual capital. You want experience, know-how, intuition, innovation, leadership, analysis. That's why you go to a stockbroker, not to buy stocks at all but to get in intellectual capital, which robots cannot provide. But what about garbage men? Are they gonna be put out of a job? No, because robots cannot recognize garbage. Every piece of garbage is different. When a robot looks at a table, a robot sees lines, circles, squares, and triangles. That's it. The robot doesn't see a chair, a table. It just sees lines, circles, squares, and cylinders. It doesn't understand chairness, tableness. It doesn't understand. So garbage men will have jobs in the future. Construction workers will have jobs in the future. Gardeners will have jobs in the future. Police will have jobs in the future because every garden, every construction site, every crime is different. And now let me say something about a revolution even bigger than anything I've talked about so far. This is huge. And this is the revolution in medicine, the digitalization of life itself. This, for example, is the way we will have diagnostics in the future. It is a pill. You swallow it, there's a TV camera inside, along with a magnet to guide it, and a chip. You swallow it, and it takes beautiful pictures of your intestines as it moves inside your, your bowels. Because we all know what middle-aged men fear the most. What do middle-aged men fear the most? The C word, colonoscopy. That's when they stick that tube up your rear. However, this gives new meaning for the expression, intel inside. <laughs> yes, intel will be inside in the future. And this is the future of cancer research. Today, if you have cancer, the doctor says you got six months, two years left to live. In the future, you'll go to the toilet. The toilet has a chip in it. That chip scans your bodily fluids for fragments of cancer genes, cancer proteins, cancer enzymes, maybe 10 years before a tumor forms. Ladies and gentlemen, the word tumor will disappear from the English language. These are called liquid biopsies. 
They're now beginning to enter into the public domain even as we speak. Liquid biopsies giving you warning that something is wrong with your body. In the future, if you're a woman and you feel something in your breast, it's too late. They don't tell you this. You have 10 billion cancer cells growing in your breast. You are on the operating table. No ifs, ands, or buts. You are on the operating table. In the future, you go to the toilet, and the toilet says, you have breast cancer. Do something. You have 10 years to do it. And this is the future of the MRI scan. We all know how huge MRI machines are. But according to the laws of physics, we can now reduce an MRI down to this big. In Germany, this is now the world's smallest MRI machines. And according to the laws of physics, we can make an MRI machine this big. You are now looking at the future of medicine. This is the tricorder from Star Trek instantaneous understanding of what's inside your body complements of Moore's law. DNA, of course, is leading the way, and we will use that information to create a new body. This is an ear. It's made out of plastic. You seed it with cells from your ear, which proliferate, giving you a perfect ear. This is bone on the left. This is cartilage on the right, noses and ears, all grown from your own cells, so there's no rejection mechanism. This is a complete bladder grown from your own cells with no rejection mechanism. The next organ to be grown, we can't quite do it yet, but the next organ to be grown is the liver. So for all you alcoholics in the audience, you can drink up tonight, hoping that we scientists can make livers before your liver wears out. Windpipes can also be grown in the laboratory. And even the brain is now being analyzed using MRI scans. Using MRI, we can actually look at the nature of thought now. And we can actually prove that some old wives' tales are correct. For example, every mother knows in their heart of hearts, every mother believes that their teenage children suffer from brain damage. It's true. Brain scans of teenagers show that the prefrontal cortex is not fully formed. They are, in some sense, mentally retarded. <laughs> also, study, it also was an old wives tale that when a man talks to a pretty girl, he starts to act stupid. It's true. Studies on college students show that when a man talks to a pretty girl, blood drains from the prefrontal cortex, and the man starts to act mentally retarded. <laughs> Absolutely true. We can measure that effect now. And we want to connect the mind to a computer. And with that computer, we want to have it controlled an exoskeleton. This is the United States Pentagon spending $150 million connecting the brain to an exoskeleton so that you become Iron Man. This is to treat wounded warriors from Iraq and Afghanistan. So external prosthesis, prosthetics, exoskeletons controlled by thought. And in Japan, you can also put a headband that picks up electrical activity of the brain. So when you go to a party, this headband has two ears on it. When you talk to someone who's interesting, the two ears light up. When you talk to someone who's boring, the two ears go like that. So in Japan, you always know if you're going to go home alone after a party. We can also record memories now. This was done last year, made headlines. We can now record simple memories in mice and upload these memories as well. Next year, we're going to start on primates, recording simple memories in monkeys. And after that, Alzheimer's patients. On the right is a memory chip. The United States Pentagon has given $50 million grant to anyone who can create a memory chip to augment fading memories. This means that perhaps we'll be able to upload entire memories. Think of the movie uh, The Matrix, where reality itself was uploaded into uh, Keanu Reeves' mind. In fact, sometimes late at night, late at night, I get a weird sensation. 
Let me ask you a question. Late at night, just before you go to sleep, when you get drowsy, have you ever had that feeling that maybe life is an illusion? That maybe you're the only real person? Everything else is just something that's been uploaded into your mind? Ever had that feeling? Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you ever had that feeling late at night. Well, you're crazy. <laughs> you think you're the only person alive? That everything else is an illusion? Come on, give me a break. How can that be? You see, I'm the only person who's alive. <laughs> you are nothing but a memory uploaded into my mind. I'm actually in New York right now. You know that? I'm actually in New York enjoying myself just before I doze off to go to sleep. And did you know that we can actually photograph a dream? This is right out of science fiction, right out of Harry Potter. But at Berkeley, on the left, we can scan the human brain with an MRI scan, divide blood flow into 30,000 dots, analyze these 30,000 dots, and come up with a reasonable picture of what you are thinking about. On the right-hand side, the upper level, are the actual pictures you're looking at. Below these pictures are the computer simulations created by scanning the human brain, dividing blood flow into 30,000 pixels, putting it into a computer, which then prints out an image of what you are thinking about. What this means is that in the future, we will have a library of souls. Today, when you go to the library, you take a book of Winston Churchill, and, well, that's all you can do is read a book. In the future, you'll go to the library, and you will see a three-dimensional holographic image of the person you want to talk to, and you will talk to that person, interact with that person. That person has the same personality, the same memories as you. In other words, one day perhaps your great, 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 great grandkids will go to the library and talk to you because your memories are encoded on a chip. So this is something to think about for the future. And now I'd like to make some closing remarks. Late last night, I got this emergency call from BBC television, and they wanted an immediate Skype interview concerning the recent discovery of gravity waves, vindicating Einstein's theory made 100 years ago. Well, it was late, but I said, sure. Because you see, Einstein was my childhood hero. And my favorite Einstein story is this. When Einstein was an old man, he was tired of giving the same talk over and over again. So one day his chauffeur came up to him, and the chauffeur said, Professor, I'm really a part-time actor. I've heard your speech so many times, I've memorized it. So why don't we switch places? I will put on a mustache, I will put on a wig, I will be the great Einstein, and you can take a rest and be my chauffeur. Well, Einstein loved the joke, so they switched places. This went along famously until one day. A mathematician in the back asked a very difficult question. And Einstein thought, oh, the game is up. But then the chauffeur said, that question is so elementary that even my chauffeur here can answer it for you. <laughs> Thank you very much. You've been a great audience. And we'll take questions and answers.